Hi, and welcome back to Winter Wonderland Zoo. As we zoom in, you can see I did a little more decorating up front. I also put up some more rocks and some little red orbs that glow in the dark. Well, glow when it's dark. Yeah, and it looks kind of terrifying. Anyway, we have babies. Look at that. Nah. The red pandas have babies. Well, they had one baby who is oddly coordinated with the mom. And the bears had two cubs. Once again, I am doing the entire voiceover in one take. So, uh, yeah, usual disclaimer. One other thing that I did was uh, make a new decorated Christmas tree because that one, you can recolor the lights, not the berries. And uh, like I said last time, the color scheme of this, look at that pretty. The color scheme of this particular habitat will be more of an icy white and blue. So needed a different pretty tree. The animal who will be moving in here is the king penguin. Now, I decided to spend a little time on some facts about penguins. The king penguin in particular, but penguins in general as well. Now, in total, there are 18 species of penguins, and they live pretty much entirely in the southern hemisphere which means this here is supposed to be an arctic zoo penguins wouldn't actually live here completely other side of the earth so if anyone starts going off about how peng um how polar bears eat penguins uh, they do not because polar bears live in the arctic and penguins live in the antarctic and also other places. Those who play Planet Zoo will know the African penguin does not live in a cold area. But those who do, all do so in the Antarctica area. Yes. Most penguin species, unfortunately, are endangered. But the king penguin is uh, categorized as least concern. There are roughly 1.6 million breeding pairs of king penguins so um, a lot of birds out there and they they breed in colonies of uh, upwards of hundreds and th hundreds of thousands of individuals don't know why that was so difficult to say but uh gigantic huge colonies um even though they are pretty abundant now. They were nearly wiped out by hunters who wanted them for, for oil production in, in the 1800s and early 1900s. But once once humans stopped doing that, they, uh, they bounced back. Now, later on in this video, you're gonna see I, I, um, I built some little nests because I thought it looked cute. That is not biologically accurate at all because king penguins, like a lot of penguins, um, they don't build nests. They incubate their eggs directly on their feet, which is kind of smart when you think about it. The eggs get the heat from below and from above and the feet can isolate or insulate the, the eggs from the, the cold, cold ground. Although they don't actually nest and breed um, where there's snow. They, they have their colonies or breeding areas by the ocean where I'm not even really sure why there is no snow there because they can't be so close to the waves that the waves come like crashing up because then they get wet and maybe it's the wind. I don't know. Either way, they nest by the sea because what they eat is fish. And uh, speaking of eating, once the eggs have hatched, the, the chicks will actually sometimes not eat for months, which really surprised me when I started doing a, 
a little bit of impromptu penguin research here. I thought, I mean, these are baby birds, right? They have to pretty much eat constantly. I don't know if anyone here has any experience with rearing baby birds, but in general, you, you're up like <laughs> every two to three hours, sometimes more often when they're, when they're really young, to feed them because they have to eat constantly. But baby penguins, apparently, um, when their parents go out to sea to eat, they, they can be just left alone for months without food. Yeah, let that one sink in. Now the king penguin, which like I said is the species I'll be having in here, the king penguin was was named the king penguin because when it was discovered back in the early 1700s, it was thought to be the largest of the penguins, and it was the largest that had been seen at that point. But in fact, the emperor penguin is larger. Now the emperor was was not the emperor. The emperor penguin was first seen about. 50, 60, 70 years later, and at that time, no one really realized that they were two different species. They just thought, oh, we've seen a big penguin. We've seen that before. So for a really long time, they were just all called king penguins, the ones that we now call kings and emperors. It wasn't until the mid 1800s, so 150 years after the first king penguin was seen that scientists were biologists, rather, at the British Museum realized, wait a minute, um, these, these are two different species. And I guess they could have, they could have gone in one of two directions with the naming, because you can't have two species with the same name, obviously. They could have just kept the name King for the one that then turned out to be the largest, which is not the one that's, yeah. But they decided to keep the name that was first given to these penguins, keep that for the species that was first discovered and originally named King Penguin. So then they kind of had to come up with, you know, an even quote unquote bigger name for the one that was actually bigger. And that one then ended up being called the Emperor Penguin. So that's why we have two royal penguins. Yes. And to return to the video, I used both the, um, what are the Arctic and uh, about the tundra and taiga rocks for this one, mixing them. And I've seen someone else do it where it looked, just looked really, really good mixing these two. And I'm not quite, I'm not 100% happy with the result in this habitat, honestly. But what I'm doing here with, with putting sort of a, a rocky area a little bit further back and away from people, even though there is actually a peek into the cave underneath it, that is actually inspired by Copenhagen Zoo, where they recently expanded. They have, I think they have Humboldt's penguins, so quite a bit smaller. Um, and, and they also have completely different nesting behavior. But... What they experienced was that after they expanded the penguin habitat and put in an area that was a little more private, the penguins started breeding. So giving them that little space, it's also further up, so they have more of a, I guess, more of a sense of safety because they can they can like look out over the, the environment and see from a distance that there are no predators. Half sentence. Yes, that's what I'm trying to do here. Give them this this sort of more private area a bit further up in the air. I just, I like the way that it looks. And also they, they would need shelter if I was playing in, um, in, well, not in sandbox mode, in franchise mode is what it's called.
Moving on to the foliage, I really wanted to keep that to a minimum because they do live in, well, the Antarctic. And, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty much rock and, then, and ice. The area around the habitat, um, I did off camera. You'll see that in a moment. I put down quite a bit more vegetation than I did inside of the habitat. And that is um, more inspired by, is it there? No, still not, still not quite there. Uh, yeah, so the, the vegetation outside the habitat, apart from the decorated blue trees, here we go with the nests. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's wrong, but cute. Anyway, to um, attempt for the third time to say what I was going to say and then didn't say because I interrupted myself, the vegetation around the habitat, there it is, is more inspired by pictures I've seen of Greenland in the summer. So here we are with the cuties. They're, they're really cute. Walking in a line. And a really good, I think, um, underwater viewing space. And the road goes up around it. I like to make sure that I have, that I have slopes rather than stairs. Um, yeah, I also did a significant amount of rock work off camera. And uh, just forgot that little piece of land right there. Now the plant that I'm plopping down right here, um, the first one, is actually an underwater plant, but I really like putting it up um, up on dry land. Uh, it, it, it can sort of be used to mimic heather. Yeah, I did say I prefer using slopes rather than stairs um, because, surprise, disabled people exist. People who need to use a wheelchair for one reason or another, or just people who have a hard time walking. Um, yes, people exist. They don't exist in this game, which uh, I have seen people being not entirely happy about, and I can very much understand that as a form of erasure, like, disabled people don't exist, everyone can walk, uh, no. Anyway, that is uh, why I put in ramps instead of stairs. In this place right here, I did decide to put in a staircase because it was the only way I could actually get a path up to the extra area that I added on top of the staff buildings. But I figured since there's also a, a, a ground level area with a ramp, I'm not going to keep people who can use stairs from having an extra area. Yes. In this roof, I know that I've struggled with roofing in the past. Those of you who have watched my, my franchise series will have heard me. Um, let's use the word complaining <laughs> about, about roofing and just never really seeming to get it right. I'm actually quite happy with the way this turned out. Even if it is a little bit odd looking with this glass roof on top of a halfway open bottom structure. I think it works. And I just realized I put an icicle covered ice cream shop in a, a tour, a, like the North Pole. And people are standing in line. I guess they're Scandinavians. I live in Denmark and uh, yeah, we will eat ice cream outdoors all year round. We're Vikings. Or weirdos. Either way. We are now nearing the end of, I guess, the second speed, speed build in this video, the little ice cream place. And I have a, a few very quick facts to give you about ice cream. Because when we think of ice cream, it is something you store in a freezer but it's actually existed a lot longer than freezers have. 
um, the oldest accounts of ice cream date back to before the Roman Empire. Yeah, let that one sink in. Is that the second time I said that in this video? I think it is. Yeah, sorry about that. Anyway, the Emperor Nero, known um, pretty much as a horrible person, I think maybe I'm making that up. Anyway, he uh, he would send runners, like slaves, into the mountains to fetch him snow that he could then flavor with uh, fruits and honey and stuff. So the idea of, of, of eating basically flavored snow, flavored ice, with um, as as a treat has been around for a very, very long time. And uh, it was, I mean, for obvious reasons, reserved for the super rich, for the absolute elite for a very long time. It wasn't until, well, the Victorian era and uh, around that time in the mid 1800s when uh, we started getting something resembling a freezer that ice cream began to become available to the masses, but it had been eaten by kings and queens for thousands of years before that. And suddenly she stopped talking. This, this was, yeah, I'm missing a piece of, of wall there. I, I did end up putting that one in. And here we have the very last look at the penguins. I think you get to see the nests up there. I put extra sticks and eggs in them, so they're, they're very, very cool. So um, I was going to talk about what's going to happen in the next few episodes, but I think I'm just going to talk about that in the next episode instead, because we are getting very close to the end. So, um, yeah, happy December. Bye.